And away we go. Donna Brazil, you've had one hell of a month. But you've had it on Fox, which is very strange for me to, to be seeing you, but it's got to be even more different for you to be experiencing it. How is Fox different from CNN? Well, it, it, in many ways, it's the same type of, of format where you are, you know, um, you see it with a Republican. Hopefully, in my case, I like to be seated next to Carl Rowe because Carl and I have been involved in politics for the last 30 years. We know each other very well. We respect each other. I understand that on a, on a night like uh, Tuesday, November 3rd, Carl and I are doing the same thing. We're looking at the counties. We're looking at the actual results that are coming in. And I enjoy sitting next to someone with his experience. Now, on occasion, I, I'm, I'm seated with someone who uh, not only, uh, well, let, let, let me just say this. They're not, uh, they're unfamiliar with the political territory that I'm familiar with, but they, they are policy experts. So I, I've enjoyed my relationship with Fox, as you all know, some, some of them are my best friends, Dana Perino. Uh, I've known Juan Williams for a long time, so I enjoy sitting in for him on the five. Bill Hemmer was a colleague at CNN. So in many ways, it, it, it's similar, but Frank, I made the decision to join the Fox News Network for, for one principal reason. And that is, I wanted to talk to Americans who were quite different than me in terms of political philosophy and so forth. So I've learned a lot. Uh, of course, I've argued a lot, but by and large, I, I enjoy my experience on the Fox News Network. Is there anyone, I, I've applauded on air live, both Neil Cavuto and Brett Baer for their willingness to challenge the administration. But I've also had issues with some of the evening hosts for just going along and being cheerleaders when it's supposed to be a news network, not just about commentary. Is there anyone at Fox that, that really that you find challenging and difficult because you just can't engage them? Well, let me also add to that list, Chris Wallace. He is, he is a, he's great. I, I love being on uh, Fox News Sunday. I will be on his show, How It Hurts. Of course, I, I work with him at CNN. But you know, um, I've appeared on Luke Dobbs. I've appeared on uh, several other shows. I think I've appeared once or twice on Tucker, uh, once or twice with uh, Sean Hannity, several times with Laura. Uh, we don't agree, but we can still have a very good discussion. Sometimes he it, especially with Sean, because he likes that rapid Hey, Donna, what do you stand on the climate, uh, no, the Green New Deal? And I try to explain that not, not all Democrats are like, but I'm not offended by that. You know, on CNN, um, when I first started on CNN back in 2001, Judy Woodruff had Mary Matlin and I appear every Thursday. And Mary and I had a great opportunity to disagree without being disagreeable. Some people didn't even know that Mary and I were in the same facilities, and afterwards we would go out and have a, a nice cocktail. Um, I was on, also on every Sunday uh, with Robert George and and Jonah Goldberg. So I'm, you know, to me, conservatives, I know conservatives. I have conservatives in my family. I know Republicans. I have Republicans in my family. But not many Americans know that while we, we might, you know, believe in two different philosophies or we might have, we might belong to a political party, many of us are friends. I mean, Barbara Comstock, who lost her race uh, and 2018 is a good close friend of mine. And I still talk to Barbara Comstock. We're still doing a lot of work. And Michael Steele, the former chair of the Republican Party, we work together on a number of issues. And so this partisan divide is, in some ways is manufactured. But what, what really concerns me, Frank, and I think you can help us all understand this, is why are we so fractured now? What is causing these deep divisions? And I think if you look at the results from 2020, uh, the one big uh, the, the one big headline is that the American people voted, but we're still deeply divided. So what is, if you had to identify it, and, and I, I'm going to, I'll start so I don't put you on the spot, but I blame social media for a lot of this. And yes, it did exist in 2016 and it even existed to a small degree in 2012, but nothing like what it is now and that the negativity and the divisiveness and the ugliness and the and how the worst the worst thing you can say gets magnified so many times 
and the nicest stuff you can say is just completely forgotten. I blame social media for it, and I blame how we collect our news. And we don't seek to inform ourselves, we seek to affirm ourselves. And I'd be curious, am I missing something there? Am I, first off, am I wrong? And no, secondly, is I, I think you're right. I mean, look, I, uh, if you came to my house right now, you would, I can offer you something cold to drink if that's your preference or something warm. And uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, I had that earlier. But uh, let me just say this, I have the Wall Street Journal, I have uh, the Financial Times, the Washington Post, and, and the New York Times. I try to read as much as possible. I want to be informed, I don't want to be affirmed. I want to know more about what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm, I'm interested in all of these vaccines and all of the, the ways in which we're going to distribute. So I'm reading multiple uh, publications in order to get uh, as much information as possible. I'm going online to, to, to try to learn more. Here's what I, I, I figured out. Uh, when I appear on television, whether it's ABC News with George Stephanopoulos or Fox News, uh, what happens is I get immediate, uh, I get uh, several tweets and some, some posting on Facebook. Often people say, I like the way you looked, I like what you said, and then I get some people like, you know, why don't you just disappear? Why don't you stop talking? Or they'll repeat something that they've read on social media. I try to ignore it. Uh, earlier today, I had some free time and I started to respond to some of my Facebook Messenger uh, uh, comments. And some of the people are like, is this really down in Brazil? I'm like, yeah. Look, we're bitterly divided, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation. And I try to have conversations with people that disagree with me. What is it about your background? Because you are different. Uh, I uh, I always have trouble with James Carville. He's very funny, <laughs> very animated, but for me, he's very, very difficult. Uh, and there's just some people who are much more partisan and much rougher in terms of how they respond to things. What is it in your life? Because you're different. I mean, if people, you and I know each other. We've known each other for a long time. You've always been kind to me. You've always been supportive, uh, um, like a friend. I mean, a real friend. But I respect your work. I respect your work, Frank. I mean, you and I have been to Iowa, New Hampshire. We've been all over this country. I've seen you in places where, you know, I might look up and there's Frank Lawrence, you know. You've hired some of my kids that I've taught at Georgetown to be your interns. I mean, so let's be honest. It, it, it starts with the basic premise that you are a professional. I respect your work. You've been out there for a long, long time. Uh, you, you, you dive into some of the what I call the underbelly of American politics, where we can get into what's really happening. So I, I appreciate that because we're not all the same, uh, but we share a great country and the same values. I was born in the segregated South. Uh, and as I came up in politics, the Democratic Party was changing. It was it was changing from a very conservative party that excluded, uh, excluded um, uh, blacks from participation to a party that began to embrace African-Americans. And so, I got involved in the party when it was changing from the, the philosophy uh, of the past to one that I think is, is more philosophy that will embrace in, uh, diver, uh, diversity and inclusion. So I, I understand, uh, Frank, growing up in Louisiana, that I have a conservative governor that is pro-life and pro-guns. He is to the right of me, but he is my best friend. He is a good man. and. Because of John Bell Edwards, my father was able to get some of the best treatment. My John Bell is, an, uh, is a veteran. My daddy was a, uh, a decorated war hero. And when I told John Bell, who was at that moment a state legislator uh, from Amit, Louisiana, and Ponchatoula, uh, Louisiana, and I said, Tangibahoa Parish, I went up there and I said, John, I need some help. And he said, what do you need? I said, my dad is really sick. And I can't put him in a traditional nursing home because he's a veteran and he really needs the kind of care that, you know, often wounded veterans need at that age. And John Bell helped me. And so he, he helped me as a friend. And for, for that and for many other reasons, I have, I have a, 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 a lot of admirations. When I tell my friends I'm going home to campaign for John Bell Edwards, they say, are you crazy? He's pro-guns, he's pro-life. I say, yeah, but you know what? He expands in Medicaid so that poor people can have access to health care. He's doing something about climate change and the coastal uh, restoration. I care about that. He's also helped to rebuild our school and his education, one of the cornerstones of his administration, of course, economic development. So John Bell is one of my best friends. Mary Landry is a good friend. John Burrow. I grew up with 
the Long family with the Bobs and uh, Lindy uh, Bobs. And so that's my background. And because of that, I can come to Washington, D.C. and work across the aisle. New Kendrick is a friend. People say, he's your friend. I say, yes. We also, sometime when he's in D.C., we go to the same church. Uh, so I know New Kendrick. Now, will we agree on issues? No. But why should I dislike New Kendrick simply because uh, we have profound disagreements on issues? But we're both Catholics. We understand politics, and we can sit there and 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 talk about uh, some of the most important issues facing our country. Well, I want to emphasize to those listening that you've got a heart as big as, not as big as New Orleans, as big as all of Louisiana, and it it just and it shows in your appearances on TV, and it shows when the cameras aren't on, and I really appreciate it. You are when I know that I'm going to be in a on a panel with you or on a show with you, I'm loving it because it's going to be a great experience. So we've got another Louisiana who's on this Fox Rich, uh, and she even knows to call you Ms. Donna, which I love. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about Trump's decision not to concede? Let's go right into 2020. I am going to ask you at some point Randy Ford's question, which is compare this with 2000. But for now, Donald Trump is not conceding. Uh, is this a disgrace? Should we be patient with him? Look at the bigger picture and what's good for the country. What's your reaction? Well, I, I got to start with the, the 2000 experience. And as you well know, uh, I was in that room when Al Gore first made the call. Uh, and then I was in the room when the second call uh, came. Uh, and I also recall vividly the night that the Supreme Court stopped the Florida recount and Vice President Gore called and said, shut it down. And I said to the Vice President, I said, what do you mean? He said, shut it down, shut it down. Well, we had already moved the operations out of Tennessee. Chip Smith had begun to, you know, box up everything and get all of the accounting stuff right. Because as you well know, when a campaign ends, you got to get prepared for the FEC audits and all of the other stuff that you have to do. But it was my responsibility as campaign manager to follow the direction of the vice president. He said, look, we're already late in the game. And, and George, then Governor Bush, had to begin the transition. And we began the transition right away, at least those who were in the White House. I was not in the White House. But it was my responsibility to convey that to not just the staff and volunteers, but our supporters. And I can tell you, they were very disappointed. So I understand when you lose that you're disappointed, that you, that Frank, you're taking a look at the results and you're like, how the hell did I miss that one? I mean, why didn't we put more money in Duval County? Why didn't we win Tennessee? I mean, there were so many ways in which I could, you know, essentially began to refocus my energy, but the anger was there, the disappointment was there because those are human emotions. I understand that the president would like to see all of the votes counted. I too like this. I, I am a firm believer that every vote must be counted. But here's where I disagree with the president. Unless you have allegations of fraud, unless you have allegations of any type of legalities, you don't constantly run this through the courts only for the courts to tell you, huh, bring the proof. There's no proof. So what he's doing is he's selling the water. He is, he is essentially, you know, galvanizing his support. Meanwhile, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won. They won. They did two things that Democrats don't do well. One, it went back into the states that they lost in 2016, and they found those voters who didn't turn out, and they got them out. So the margins in, in, in uh, Michigan, as you all know, are large. The margin in, in Pennsylvania is medium but comfortable. The margin in Wisconsin is small but still you can't overturn that. And let me also say this. I, I'm disappointed in North Carolina, but we'll fight that one in 2024. Georgia, come on. They just came through. And Texas, I'm disappointed, but we'll fight that one in 2024. When you lose elections in Arizona, that was a big surprise. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I finally decided that I could drink champagne after I seen Arizona come across the finish line. But when you lose, you go back and you, you go back and you look under the hood and say, okay, what did I do wrong? How come I did not get out enough voters? What is the message that uh, what what is the message that voters who voted for the other candidate? What message were they sending? Did they 
So there are many ways to look at this, but I, I would hope, and you know, I have a lot of friends, I know but people, people don't know me well enough, but I have a lot of friends who back Donald Trump. Uh, I've, I've reached out to several of them, including Chris Christie. I've reached out to uh, Cora Lewandowski, because of course, Cora and I, you know, the, the former campaign managers, we belong to exclusive club. You know that, right? We're, we're a club of possibly now about 50 or 75, but if you run a presidential campaign, you know every campaign manager that ever existed in the book. And I reached out to him first to, to, to uh, talk about what, what, what's happening on his side, but also to check on his health because I want him to recover from this virus. But I think the president has to work it through, but at some point he needs to say to the GSA, he needs to say to the government, <clears throat> It's we the people. It's no longer we the Republicans, we the Democrats. It's we the people. The people have spoken. Please allow uh, President-elect uh, Joe Biden to begin the transition. That is so crucial. What and happens? This is what about happens? the country right now. This is not about President Trump. Should He has every reason to walk out that White House with his head up high if he wants to walk out that White House with his head up high. But the way in which he's going out right now, it is a disgrace to our democracy. What happens if he doesn't? I, like, what, what, what will Fox do? And I know, by the way, not to go back to Fox, but the ratings are getting crushed. What, what should happen if he we come back after Thanksgiving, and the Electoral College, and they're about to send their delegates to Washington? What happens if Trump doesn't concede? What do you advise? Yeah, the process is going to go forward, and it is you, as you well know. Uh, Secretaries of states from both political parties have already said that they're going to certify the results and the electors will be uh, uh, seated and they will uh, deliver the results. So by December 14th, if the president can't accept the reality today for the good of the country, for the good of the country, then hopefully uh, when the electors come to Washington, D.C., he will accept the results. No matter what happens, as Mitch McConnell said on January 20th, 2021, uh, President uh, Trump and his family will have to depart the White House. Uh, I want to take you back to 2000 for two questions. I did not realize that you were in the room. What happened in the hours, as you're watching it, what happened in the hours that we may not know the story of as Al Gore went from victor to loser and then to someone who had a legitimate claim. It was it was uh, in, intense. It was raining that day, very heavy rain. And uh, we were at the Lowe's Hotel um, on West End, and uh, the vice president was receiving a briefing. We went into his suite. Uh, when I say we, it was Bill Daly, who was the chair of the campaign. I was campaign manager, Michael Hooley, Michael Feldman, uh, Woodhouse, a, a number of people, Wendy. I can remember everybody in that room. I have a photographic memory. And I um, was our, our Secret Service guy, we used to call him Bill Pickle. Uh, everyone had names. And um, the vice president looked at the results and, and we saw the results. I and mean, we were disappointed that Tennessee did not come in. And we kept looking at the Florida results. And as you know, uh, when um, my friend at ABC, uh, Peter Jennings, when the late Peter Jennings, when he called it, I think it was Jennings who called it before Brokaw, but I could be wrong. One of the one of the two, uh, I know it was a man, <laughs> but he called it, and we we're like, "Yeah, we won!" And then someone else called it, and we lost. So the vice president, then well, the vice president called George Bush. Uh, we when we when we were winning. Uh, we thought, well, we were waiting for him to call us, but when we were losing, Bill Daly gave uh, the vice president the number, the call was made, and I could hear what the vice president was saying to then Governor Bush. Uh, and then we all got ourselves together. We were watching it. Tony Coelho was there. We were all watching the results. And here come the news that it was likely to go into a recount. We were on the way to the war memorial where our victory speech and the vice president was ready uh, to do his speech. And then Bill Daly uh, was told from 
Michael Hooley, who was still in the war room, to Michael Feldman. I was in like the fifth car behind the, the limousine. And we got the message to Vice President Gore that essentially there would be a recount. Uh, Bill Daly made the announcement uh, so that we can disperse the large crowd that had gathered in Nashville. And then we got back to the Lowe's Hotel and began to figure out what the legal and political strategy would be. As you know, I had no idea at that time it would be over 37 days before uh, the results would come in. But it was probably one of the most difficult days of my life. We faced a legal battle. We faced a, uh, a, a political battle because George Bush was winning. Let's just say that he was winning. He had the most votes. We believed that we had a, a good strategy to get all of the votes counted. As you recall, we had the, the butterfly ballot. We had the chads, the hanging chads, the swinging chads, and my favorite, the pregnant chad. But we had all kind of uh, shenanigans that had happened in other parts of the state. Uh, but we knew that it was Florida. We assembled a good legal team. And then, as you know, we know what the results are. But it, 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 it was a moment in history, unlike any other period in history. You have to go all the way back to 1876 to see such, um, you know, disarray and disruption. But here we are again. So what's it like uh, by that point? For most of my adult life, I've worked for the media. I've not really worked in many presidential campaigns. And I know, I know the intellectual uh, issues. I'm speaking emotionally. You think you've won the election. Then you think you've lost the election. Then you're in the election. Then there are a couple of decisions that are made by the courts that really look like Al Gore was going to take this. Then you got the Supreme Court dashing all those hopes. I've never asked you emotionally, what were those 37 days like? I have never been on the cliff in my entire life. I've always been steady in a storm, steady, steady, steady. But for the first time in my adult life, I was just exhausted. Remember, many of us who get involved in presidential politics, we start two years out. And for most of my adult life, going all the way back to when I was 18, I, I have spent practically every even year of my life working on a campaign. In odd years, I always tell people I get caught up on my sleep and try to make a few dollars to catch up. Uh, but here I, I left Capitol Hill. I was on the Hill for a while. And I left Capitol Hill in March, right after the impeachment stuff. In March of uh, 1999, I went straight to the Gore campaign. In September, I became campaign manager. And we won all of our primary and caucuses against, we had one, one opponent, Bill Bradley, so we were on a roll. I mean, uh, we had a good strategy going into the fall, but I kept reminding people that I was afraid of Tennessee. And people would come up to me and they said, why are you worried about Tennessee? It's Al Gore's home state. I said, yeah, but it, you know, I'm one of those people that go shopping a lot. I go to grocery stores and yes, I go to Walmart from time to time and other places. And I kept, people kept looking at me with my Gore, you know, button and they're like, you with Al Gore? And I said, yeah, I'm his campaign manager. Well, I'm not going to vote for him. I'm like, why? Well, we don't see him. He flies in and flies out. He never stops. And I kept saying, oh, my God. So I went to Bob Strum and a couple of my other colleagues and said, Carter Eskew, I said, we got a problem. And, of course, you know, I'm going to make a comment that I hope you still like, man. Everybody pay attention to these damn polls. Polls, polls, polls. Well, look, I love polls, all right? A poll is like a GPS. It, it, if you don't know where you're going, it'll tell you where to go, right? But if you know where you're going, it'll guide you to something else. Well, we were following the polls, and they're like, we're doing fun. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I said, we better get to Memphis. We better lock down Nashville. I don't, I don't feel good about anything in the eastern part, Knoxville and Chattanooga. And I kept emphasizing this, and I, I, I lost out. You know, the other thing about being a manager is that people think that you control everything. I didn't control everything. I control what I could control. And when you're in a big campaign, uh, I'm not the best fundraiser in the, in the family. I'm not, the, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not the best comms person, but I'm one of the best organizers. And I kept saying, I need some people on the ground in Tennessee. And they ignored me. They ignored me, and, it, and I had no, no way to get resources because in the general election, uh, we didn't have, we, we only had, what, 
resources we had from the federal government. So we lost Tennessee and it really hurt. So during that 37, 38 days, in addition to I'm dealing with staff, remember I got people in all 50 states. I'm like a mama, okay? I'm a mama and I'm worried about my children, my babies. I gotta let some of them go. They got families, they need help here. I'm trying to maintain, you know, this entire Lord's family while dealing with both the vice president and at the time, Senator Joe Lieberman. So it was, it was, like I said, I was right on the edge, right on the edge. And when I say on the edge, I was, I had mental and physical exhaustion like I cannot even tell you. When campaigns are over with, I often come down with a bad cold or something because my body is just torn down. And um, back then I was in my late thirties, I had turned 40 on that campaign and I was just ripped shit tired. And mental, remember, I, I gave up everything to work for Al Gore. I, I lost, I left my job. Uh, I, actually, I left my house in DC and I moved down to Tennessee. So I had to think about, oh my God, I gotta go back to Tennessee and I gotta shut down my life. And I gotta move back to Washington, DC and I gotta find a job. Luckily, I got a chance to go to Harvard Institute of Politics and I can I put my life back together and the rest is history. And I'm very, I will always be grateful for that opportunity to go back to, to go up to Harvard to uh, get my life back. Well, that was, uh, that was the first time I was doing focus groups on television and MSNBC sent me down to Florida and we did three sessions and they actually had to call the cops. It got so ugly and it wasn't in my group because I would not let people do that. And I had got a reputation for yelling at people, but I had to, it was the only way to keep order that people were screaming at each other and I'm just yelling, we are going live on national television, cut it out. And we took a break. It was on the Chris Matthews show. We took a break and the women got into a fight in the ladies restroom, mm. a fight, like screaming at each other where the cops come in with the sirens going and they actually came in and had to separate the women. And when they sat everybody down, they, had, they took one of the women away. It was really, really bad. So um, now, can I tell you something about this story that um, that's an interesting part of it? So we end with all of the chaos, all of the division. But for the next two or three years, uh, whenever I ran into George Bush or Carl Rove, the president would wink at me and I'm like, don't do that. You know, you know, George Bush has a sense of humor. Don't do that. And he would like to say hello. And I'm like, yeah. And when Hurricane Katrina made landfall, um, and it was a devastating, catastrophic hurricane, my entire family was, you know, displaced. And I wrote a column in the Washington Post, Mr. President, how can I help you? And I got a call right, right away from Carl Rove, Andy Card, and Barry Jackson, Ed Gillespie, and they said, come and see us. And I had a chance uh, with civil rights leaders and others to go and see the president. And as a follow-up, the president called me and he said, and he looked at me again, he winked. And I said, why do you keep winking at me? He said, because I know you like politics and you always come over to the White House and have lunch with Carl Rove. So why don't you stop by and see me? I said, well, I, I voted for the other guy. I'm just coming over to Carl Rove to keep in touch, right? And I got a chance for three years, the last three years of his presidency, to really get to know George W. Bush, to work with the Bush administration, and I felt like I was a conduit between my governor, my mayor, and my president. And I also had a chance to work with Newt Gingrich. Of course, you know, I, I worked very closely with uh, our governor, the former governor. And when Governor Blanco passed away last year, I went home to her funeral in Lafayette, Louisiana. And as soon as I walked into the church, they had all of her, you know, paraphernalia from all her years in politics. And right there was a letter from George W. Bush. George W. Bush to my beloved governor, Kathleen Babineau Blanco. So I, 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 I want people to know that beyond this politics that you see on TV and all of this stuff you read about, we are human beings with relationships and we have relationships with people who we might not uh, be known to agree with, but 
we have relationships and we should understand that. Okay, so I've got the perfect question from Congressman Jim Greenwood. Ah. It's simple. Can Joe Biden make deals with Mitch McConnell? Can Mitch McConnell make deals with Joe Biden? I would hope so. I would hope so. I would hope that we, look, this virus, if we want our country to come back, we want to rebound from this virus, we want to get, get back on our feet, get people back uh, into their jobs, restore their livelihoods, save more lives, absolutely. Make some deals. Infrastructure. Let's work on that. Let's make sure we have a, another round of stimulus that the Fed chair, Mr. Powell, said that we need. Let's make sure that we can find a low hanging fruit. I mean, prescription drug prices. We all keep we, we keep screaming about prescription drug prices. Yeah, there's some tough issues, but let's make sure in this lame duck that we keep the government operating and that we can uh, uh, allow uh, you know Joe Biden uh, to begin to receive uh, the daily the presidential daily briefing. So yes, I do believe they have a relationship. They've known each other for over 40 years, and why break up a friendship just over you know, the uh, the outcome of the election. Well, the question that I've been asked more than any other is to use your Southern expertise and tell us, project for us, what's gonna happen in Georgia? Well, I, I think it's gonna be one of the most expensive, uh, expensive runoffs. So for those of you who love the Falcons and those of you who love college football and other sports like I do, Forget about it. I mean, you're going to be uh, inundated with a lot of TV ads. Uh, it's going to be a tight race. Now, it's an uphill battle to win two seats for the Democrats to take two seats. But I do believe that the Democrats, there's a path forward. If you look at the turnout, especially in those uh, counties around Atlanta, I still believe that the Democrats can improve their numbers. Uh, even in, in Fulton County, I mean, the turnout was, was less than 60%. And what those counties are called the black belt counties that that uh, if you're on on the road from I-20, I-85, going all the way to I-65 into Alabama, there are so many votes that the Democrats left on the table that if 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 we have a very targeted campaign, yes, I do believe that there's hope down in Georgia. Georgia's on our minds, and uh, I'm I'm excited for the runoff because uh, one. I think we need one. We need one more race to get this out of our system. But yes, uh, that that's the short short answer. But let me just advise people: do not go to Georgia when in the middle of a pandemic. There are lots of people on the ground already that can do the work. Stacey Abrams has done a fantastic job. She deserves all of the kudos for getting us to this point. But there are other organizations, the Georgia Alliance, the Black Voter Fund, and, and some of the other progressive groups that are doing voter registration, voter education, getting young people out. And I'm sure if you're on the other side of the aisle, you're looking at ways to improve the numbers because Donald, Donald Trump did not perform as well in some of the areas where he did extremely well uh, four years ago. So I'm sure that there's a, a lot there's a lot to, to dish out, but I'm confident that the Democrats are going to do very well on January 5th. So what's the strategy? Do you run a, a pro-Biden campaign, give him the ability to get his legislation done? Do you run an anti-Trump campaign? This is a way to ensure that Republicans cannot practice gridlock and a way to send a message that we've had enough of Donald Trump. Is it a positive campaign or a negative? If you had to choose and you're the strategist, would you go positive or negative? Well, for those voters who didn't turn out on election day or didn't submit their ballots or whatever problems they may have had, I would once again remind them this is this this election is about solving our immediate problems. The the virus was number one. The economy was number two for Trump voters. It was the economy for Biden's supporters. It was health care and the coronavirus. So on the positive side, I will continue to focus on that. On the negative side, you can just use the example of what's happening right now. I mean, this is a party that's not interested in government. This is a party that just wants political power, raw political power. This is a party that would rather smear you than lift you up. This is a party that don't believe that you deserve wages. So yes, you run a positive campaign on, on the competence. Joe Biden was elected because the American people believe that he can handle this pandemic and handle this virus. And the, the American people want to lower the value. They want to lower the value. And, and what Donald Trump and the Republicans will bring is more chaos and division. So I think there's a way 
to calibrate a positive campaign to get those voters out who did not show up. And there's a, <clears throat> a campaign that the Democrats have to run. And let me just say this. Uh, you've been, uh, Frank, I'm sure you've heard about this so-called civil war brewer in the Democratic Party. No, it's just another family spat. But to people who believe that the Democratic Party is moving too far to the left, I want them to go to Mississippi, South Carolina, Arizona, and Montana and ask me, why did those voters give marijuana, medical marijuana, the thumbs up, but Democratic candidates the thumbs down? Why did the, voter, why did the voters in, in Arizona give thumbs up to raising taxes on the wealthy, but Democrats thumbs down? And why are the voters in Florida raising the wage wages, but giving voters the, the Democratic candidates the thumbs down? So there's this schism, this cultural schism that is existing in this society that we also have to deal with. So I think Democrats got to make sure that all of these salacious, false uh, uh, smears uh, defund the police. The last time I checked, First, first of all, why would you take the police out of the equation? That's like taking teachers. That's like taking healthcare workers. That's like taking construction workers. Democrats are not asking for that. Yeah, maybe one or two Democrats, maybe five. But that's not the Democratic Party, and that's not Joe Biden. So I think they have to be careful to, to, uh, to have a defensive strategy as well as play a good offense. So I want to ask you, because this is such a big deal, I consider these two races to be the most important Senate races of my lifetime. You'd, you'd have to go back to 1980, and I was a kid then, before we had something so distinctive. And and I'm actually eager to go down there, although I'm not eager to step into a pandemic. David Brog asks, if the Senate remains in Republican hands, how long will it take for the country to finally get back to unity? But one of your, uh, I, I see from David, I'm a Democrat. Uh, I can work with Republicans, okay? Uh, I'm a Democrat. My values, uh, I think, align with the American dream. That's why I'm a Democrat. And I don't have a litmus test to be a Democrat. I can come into this party as raggedy and, and crazy and smart and wise as I am. I'm a Democrat, but I don't see the Republicans as demons. I don't see them as creatures that needs to be destroyed. I don't like the type of politics that says that my opponent has to be destroyed. My opponent, once an election is over with, the people will have their say. And when the people decide, then we need to get to work on what they elected. They elected, if they elected Joe Biden to fix this virus and fix this economy, that's what Joe Biden needs to work on. That's the bottom line. So I wanna to respond to David. I'm a Democrat, but I don't like the fact that if, if one party holds power, then they can't work with the other party. So if the Republicans continue to block all of the legislation that Nancy Pelosi, I mean, they're not even giving it the time of the day. They're not even allowing the legislation to go through a, a process. I mean, when Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats, she's the leader of the, the, the House, when she passed a bill with bipartisan support, give it the time of day. Let it go through the regular process. If, if it's not a good bill, then reject it. Reject it through a hearing or reject it on the floor. But to allow these bills to these bills to just you know stack up on Mitch McConnell's desk without the ability to to give him a proper and fair hearing, that is simply wrong. So Mitch McConnell has put a focus on Packing the courts. The 125 that he did not allow Barack Obama to get through and all of the other vacancies. But while that might be a goal for Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, that's not a goal for all Americans. We, we, wanna, we wanna get some relief so that we can get out of this pandemic. We wanna get people back in their school. Look, I'm a professor that's teaching all my courses online. So I wanna get back to your David Brooks thing. I do believe that divided government should not lead us astray. I mean, if you talk about Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan and what they were able to do, if you go back to what Lyndon Johnson was able to do, what Bill Clinton was able to do, you can work with the opposition or the uh, uh, opposition party without trying to destroy them. And I think that's what we have to try to find common ground, where common ground exists, infrastructure.
So it's easy to do this. It's easy to be critical of the other side. And I want to flip it because I've always done these Fridays with Frank and tried to be counterintuitive. And we're almost done. I cringe when Republicans say, say that uh, that is the loudest beep I think I've ever heard. I'm now partially deaf. Sorry about um, that. Don't worry about it. I, uh, when Republicans say or hint that in any way Donald Trump is not going to be uh, defeated, that he's going to be the next president, it really does bother me. And I think that it's, it's an embarrassment. What embarrasses you about the Democratic Party? That we're old. Wow. And look, I feel good. I feel like Elizabeth Taylor when she said, I'm a cat on a hot tin roof, but we are old. It is time for a generational change. It's time to allow a new generation of Democrats, they're younger, they're bolder, they're visionaries. Give them a seat at the table. It won't, look, here's what I say to people, Frank. No one has asked me to leave the room. People are saying, scoot over. And I'm like, hell, I'll make room for everybody. Yes, let's make room for others. Now, I love my party. I, I pray to God that I can live to be 80 so I can continue to make gumbo and drink red wine or whatever I drink. But my point is, give this next generation a seat at the table. I mean, that 2018 election, for the first time, you saw the, the average age of Democrats went from 67 to 68 down to 53. Jesus Christ. I mean, can we bring some young blood? I thought I had to go over to the, uh, the Count Dracula blood bank to get new blood in the Democratic Party. We need new blood. Joe Biden has promised to be a transitional leader, and it's time for a new generation. I'm, yeah. a, I'm not afraid of Generation X, Y, Z, millennials. That's why I'm still a college professor, because they keep me young. They keep me young. Oh, they keep me young. And I can outdance any of them. That's I want to be, I, I really do want to be in your class. Okay, then as a final question, and sir, if you would just come around for one second, because I think you'll appreciate this. So you say the Democratic Party should be young. The Speaker of the House right now is 80 years old, Nancy Pelosi. The gentleman who's about to step behind me right there would like to be Speaker of the House. Is it time for Nancy Pelosi to say 80 years it's time to give a younger person the chance to do the job. I think it's time that she set the table to ensure that there is a secession plan uh, and that she gives uh, this new generation of leaders an opportunity to serve. And, and look, there are many ways in which you can serve. You don't have to be in the top, but you got to be somewhere in the room. And I want to make it very clear. We're not asking anyone to leave the room. We're asking people to scoot over. We've got to give this generation an opportunity to serve. I am a big admirer of Nancy Pelosi because of her leadership, because she can keep the Democratic Party together. She can keep the caucus together. But you know what? I want to know what comes after Nancy Pelosi. I want to know what comes after Steny Hoy, what comes after Jim Clyburn, what comes after Nita Lloyd stepped out. I love Nancy Pelosi, but I, I believe it's time to begin to look at the secession plan for this party. How about Hakeem Jeffries? How about the Congressman from uh, New York City? I think he's he's a brilliant speaker. He's of the next generation. Uh, why not him now? Why wait? Well, look, I'm not in the caucus. I don't have a vote, but I, I, I have a voice and I've just voiced what I believe to, to, should be, you know, the Dem it's time for to have a secession plan. And I hope that Joe Biden cabinet reflects the diversity of our country. I would not be surprised if Joe Biden wouldn't put half, half his cabinet might be women. And you know what? What a statement. It's time for a change. We need to stop being fearful of change. This is a great country because we all want to participate and help make it stronger. That is the goal that we, we all hope to, to do. So let me add one more. And this is from Philip Cohen and David Dahl. Who are the next generation of leaders that you'd like to see emerge, uh, specifically on the Democratic Party? Who should we be Googling and going on YouTube? Give me three of them that I may not have heard of that uh, that will be rising and deserve to rise. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Cory Booker because he's just I think he's outstanding. And uh, if you take a look at all of the all of the 
uh, I mean, Mayor Pete, Mayor Pete just really came through. Uh, Andrew Yang came through. Uh, you know, there were so many, Alyssa Slocken, uh, I read her piece today in Political and I'm gonna reach out to her. There's so many, Cece Houlihan, there are so many Democrats right now, young and old from across the country. Mandela Barnes, who, who is uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor of the state of Wisconsin. So I'm not just looking at Washington. Take a look across this country and take a look at some of the people who are, yes, in Washington, but look across this great land of ours. There's so many good Democrats that are emerging that we need to just stop focusing all our attention on Washington, D.C. and look in our own states, look in our own communities and see a new generation rising. I am very proud to be a Democrat. I'm proud to be an American because I know that day is coming. And I'm sure on the Republican side, look at all the young people and the women, the women. I mean, Kevin McCarthy should go, you know, should say thank God for the 100th anniversary of suffrage because for the first time, the Republican Party is being fueled by young women and their active engagement in the political process. We're going to reach parity one day because we're not going to look for Democratic women or Republican women. We're going to look for great leaders and we're going to find that they are female. Well, I'll tell you that uh, uh, Kevin Kevin just yelled, he just yelled out, I agree 100%. Kevin, you owe me a good bottle of wine. <laughs> I want some good California stuff too. Hold on, he's gonna he's gonna say okay, something too. One stat I'm proud of because last last cycle was very bad for Republicans. I know. We're only seven percent of our freshman class were either women or minority. So we I have a very big freshman class right now. I know. More than 44. Fifty percent of our class is women or minority. Every Democrat we beat was beat by a Republican woman, minority, or veteran. And the thing that I found was in the Republican Party, it's harder for a woman or a minority to win the primary than it is for the general. So I leaned in on the primary. And we doubled it. We had 44 women in the last cycle win the win the after the primary. We had 94 this time. But you know, you know what woke me up? What? The union. When I watched our side stand up and the Democrats' side stand up, I was embarrassed. Yeah, you saw you saw the women in white. And yeah. I kept telling Liz Cheney, I said, Liz, look at look, we can't reach parity unless yeah. we get more women. Now that was the same that was the same uh, recipe the Democrats used in 2018. We had veterans, we had women in minority. Yep. So now both parties are going after us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hello, Kevin, did you have onions with your burger today? Oh, oh I had a long, hey, TMI. That is a TMI, brothers. And mm -hmm. Abigail, yeah, she's excellent. But we have so, we have a great bet. And, and and some of the Democrats who lost on Tuesday, they're coming back, Kevin. God's not finished with them yet. They're coming back. Well, Donna, you 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 uh, you always exceed expectations. You always excel, and and I'm grateful for your kindness and your generosity and your genuineness because you might say that well, there are a lot of people like you, and the truth truthfully, there are not. They really aren't. Uh, you're you're special. I want you to live to uh, 80. Go for 100, because you got to carry. You got to you. You have a lot of stories to tell, and I'm grateful for the time that you gave us. But you have so I much. One more story, and Kevin will love this. So you know, Steve Scalise is a good friend of mine. We both are LSU graduates, so you know we're we're good friends. And and of course, he's a good friend with my other brother, Cedric Richmond. So one day, I saw Steve and. And uh, I was checking on him to make sure he was doing well. I said, Steve, can I tell you a story? He said, yeah. I said, Steve, that seat, several uh, centuries ago, my great, great, great grandfather held that seat. So my great, great grandfather held that seat. Thomas Butler, one of the first elected members from the state of Louisiana in 1800. So that seat, the Louisiana one, belongs to me, but I'm renting it out to Steve Scalise. <laughs> Anytime you want to take it back from him, just let me know. Oh hell no. oh, hell no. I, I love I love politics, but I've never had running for office. It's like being married. You got to be, you know, you got to have one. No, no, no. I like I like the fact that I can run around and, and be free. I love, Frank, I love this country. I've been to all but one state, uh, Montana. As soon as this virus is under control, I'm going to rush up to Montana so I can be Miss USA without the bikini. <laughs> I don't know. Wow, I don't know what to say. I mean, you, you may be speechless. 
Donna, thank you very much for doing this. Everybody, I believe that next week, that gentleman that you saw will be my guest. We've got to bring these Fridays with Frank to a close because they're just too much work. Donna, you had an amazing turnout. Only two people, just two people did not stay for the entire hour. We are grateful for what you did. Thank and you. I'm grateful for your friendship. You are a very, very special lady. So it's time for me to have my virtual cocktail now? Yes, yes. You don't have to have virtually. You can be. You can drink as much as you want. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank you, Frank. Have a great weekend. And remember, this is one of the best, if not the best country in the world. So everyone, we have work to do. The election is over with, but we have to stay engaged and we got to continue to work because America needs us. So thank you, Frank. And Frank, thank you for your friendship and always your wisdom. Let's stay in touch, my buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, guys.